So this is a presentation on applying the prioritization framework and we're talking about this in the context of uh, utilizing it with NCLEX questions or any types of exam type questions where they ask you to prioritize patient care interventions or uh, certain priorities with the patient. And the other thing, reason for this is that if you can get used to the prioritization framework, you can actually apply this into the clinical setting with patients. So our goals here are to review the prioritization framework and the concepts behind that, talk about how to apply it, we'll walk through some example questions, and we will also, in those example questions, explain some of the rationale for the prioritization to hopefully help you guide your thinking around that, uh, those aspects of patient care. So when you're looking at prioritization questions, the first thing you might notice is that all the answers actually seem to be correct. And the thing that you need to be aware of is that all of them might be correct, but there will be one priority that actually takes precedence over the others. So the whole goal with, is actually trying to identify why that priority is the most important one. So the ways we actually do this is the th three main components that we're looking at is, is with the prioritization, does the intervention or the assessment maintain client safety? So client safety is always going to be the, one of the first key things. Does the prioritization follow the nursing process? So remember that we generally will always start with assessment and then figuring out what's wrong with the patient and then going on to any of the planning that we need to do, any of the interventions, and then of course the evaluation. So when you're looking at example questions that we will be doing, then you need to be able to see if that actually follows a logical process. And each step of the nursing process, do you have enough data to move forward? So if you're looking at the assessment part of it, do you have enough assessment data to actually move on to figuring out that nursing diagnosis piece or the uh, figuring out what's wrong with the patient? If you can figure out what's wrong with the patient, then do you, are you able to organize and plan care? And then this leads you into, do you know what's going on with the patient enough to guide what you're doing with your implementation or your nursing interventions? And then if you are intervening and you've got questions about interventions, then do you have what do you have the data that you need to evaluate how your intervention is going and whether that's actually effective for the patient? So that's so we are actually following the nursing process, but we're just in each step of the nursing process, you want to see if you've got the data or the uh, right priorities or the right answers to actually let you move forward to that nursing process to care for the patient. And then the other thing that we're actually going to look at are uh, the patient's needs. So whenever we're looking at the uh, prioritization questions, we want to make sure that what intervention we pick, pick actually addresses the patient's needs and that hopefully it is as patient-centered as possible. So uh, the other thing that I have on this slide is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So that also does provide a bit of a guidance for you. So things that we'll look at is whether the uh, what, whether our interventions or assessment is actually addressing their physiological needs first. So obviously if they're in physiological trouble and they've got unstable vital signs and uh, other issues that are presenting problems, then that's the main thing we need to focus on first. And then we'll look at safety. The patient can't be safe unless they're actually alive. So, and then everything else falls from that. And then we'll look more at the other, more of the psychosocial factors near the top of the pyramid that talk about in the Maslow's hierarchy, love and belonging, self-esteem, coping, any of the psychosocial factors. And those patient education, those will commonly take place after once the patient is stable. Uh, we will talk more about the prioritization framework specifically in the next slide. But the one thing to remember is that while we generally follow airway breathing circulation, airway is not always going to be the correct answer if the question doesn't present with an airway problem. Okay. So that'd be the one thing to remember. So the best example I have of this is, let's say you have a patient in pain. And we generally know that uh, patient's pain level will probably see altered vital signs, potentially if it is uh, acute pain, right? Chronic pain, we, it might be variable whether you see changes in vital signs, but for acute pain, uh, you probably will see changes in vital signs. But let's say you see uh, increase in their blood pressure and their pulse, but maybe a minimal change in the respiration. So the rests are maybe 22. So around, well, it's still in the normal range, but then you see a change in their blood pressure and their pulse, and then they're reporting seven out of 10 pain. So airway would be our, generally our first priority. However, in this case, airway doesn't seem to be the biggest problem here. It might actually be an issue with their, um, their pain because it is seven out of 10 or eight out of 10. And then we might actually look at their circulation or their perfusion. 
uh, in terms of seeing any alterations in their uh, blood pressure and pulse. So that's the thing is that we know generally that airway is our first uh, prioritization according to the framework, but it doesn't always follow that case because there isn't any, unless there's, act, um, if there's no data to actually indicate an issue. When you are looking at options for prioritization, you do want to take a look at what option or what intervention or what assessment will actually benefit the client the most and uh, what will help the client the most. So if the example with this is, let's say you have a patient that does have an altered level of oxygenation and let's say they do have a O2 side of, let's say, 88%. And, you know, your choices are put them on, you know, 10 liters or put them on two liters, then you want to think what's going on with this patient? What is the worst case scenario that can happen with them in terms of declines in their respiratory functioning? And then think that if I put them on two liters and they're at 88%, I might not really get their SATs very high. It might not be the most effective intervention. So I might look at putting them on eight to 10 liters if that was another option. Okay, so you're trying to figure out what's the option that will benefit the client the most and be the most impactful in terms of maintaining their health and well-being. In most cases with prioritization questions, you will be assessing first. However, the only caveats to this would be if you've already got data that, in, that indicates that an assessment has been done, and if you've got enough data to actually guide your nursing care or your interventions. Okay, so the question you have to ask is when you're presented with assessment data, is this enough for you to determine what you need to do for the patient next? So the example would be, let's say the patient has 7 out of 10 pain and that's all that gives you about the actual pain assessment then you probably do need to find out more about that pain assessment because if the patient has a headache as compared to seven like a really bad migraine 7 out of 10 as compared to a 7 out of 10 chest pain then there's different interventions that you're going to need to do for each of those uh, the whatever data that you pick up that guide your guide you into whatever direction so you have assessment data there, but you don't have enough assessment data to move on to that nursing diagnosis part uh, where you can actually figure out how this guides your care. So that's the other thing that you want to think about. But generally, assess first, but do evaluate what assessment data that you're given to make sure you've got enough to direct your care. So on the right hand side, you'll see the alpha prioritization chart. Of course, airway, breathing, circulation, as we probably know from our uh, previous experience with CPR. So definitely any changes with the airway where we actually can't ventilate the patient. Uh, of course, respiratory rate in terms of uh, which again relates to perfusion as well and oxygenation status. Circulation, which also relates to perfusion. And we're looking for those kinds of changes with breathing, circulation, and I guess also airway as well, that would impact the patients in terms of their change in level of consciousness and what are the physiological effects of those. Other things to note uh, with disability would be pain is listed there. So pain is sort of your fourth priority and you also have blood glucose, blood sugar, which is there. And then GCS, Glasgow Coma Scale is there as well. Okay, so uh, the other things that you'll see as you go down, like uh, you've got exposure, which was temperature, changes in temperature. So you could consider things like the concepts of infection fever. You've got wet blood cell counts, so alterations in lab values there. And then lower down, you've got fluid and electrolytes. Okay, so fluid, and they're looking more at fluid volume excess, fluid volume deficit. Okay, in most cases, uh, our main concerns are whether or not they're able to maintain proper perfusion and whether or not, and this of course does link to circulation. And then as we move further down to the goals of care, then you've got the things that are related to uh, more of the activities of daily living, nutrition, family uh, coping support. So a lot of the more of these psychosocial factors that will kind of guide your care. Now, the first things that you generally want to take a look at when you're actually looking at using this chart are, are there any red flag indicators that take you to other priorities? So my best example that I can give you right now is let's go to prioritization D where you've got disability. Now you've got uh, blood glucose and let's say you've got a patient that their blood glucose is let's say 18. Okay, So if the patient's blood glucose is 18, then what will that indicate to you in terms of their physiology and what other aspects, what other, I guess what other areas on this alpha prioritization chart might be impacted by a blood glucose of 18. So if I'm thinking that this patient is in diabetic ketoacidosis, then I might be more concerned that they might have small respirations in terms of trying to breathe off that acidotic state. 
they might have some issues in terms of their circulation, uh, in terms of uh, their glucose causing uh, fluid volume shifts. So there might be those kinds of things. Okay, so so while the presenting priority is something like an altered blood glucose, my consideration is, is this impacting other systems that might actually be higher up on the prioritization chart that I need to be aware of? So ideally, in the grand scheme of things, you do want to address the underlying cause that's leading to those problems. So the whole purpose is that I eventually I need to correct the blood glucose level to eventually co uh, correct the airway and the circulation or the breathing problems. But if they're breathing and the respiration rate is you know 32 34 then I might have to intervene with the breathing first and then take care of the blood glucose level once I can get the respirations under control so those are the kinds of considerations that you need to think of now let's uh, change that blood glucose level a little bit and let's actually put their blood glucose at 14 okay so again this is all relative I don't know how the patient is going to react to those changes in blood glucose but let's say you have a patient that their blood glucose is 14 and they are asymptomatic they don't show any other physiological signs that actually stand out then in this case my priority is actually managing their blood glucose and trying to manage their hyperglycemia to actually decrease that because again they don't have any airway breathing or circulation issues that are prominent things that I need to actually address right away so in this case my data tells me that I need to look at that blood glucose and that's the thing I actually need to handle first okay so that's what I'm trying to indicate when there's any red flag priorities that lead you to other uh, priorities on the alpha prioritization chart and then the other part to this is looking at the, whether or not we're having unexpected or unexpected findings with that patient okay so this will be the cue for you to take a look at your physiology and to make sure that you actually have an understanding of any of the conditions that actually come up in the questions okay so most of the time when you're looking at prioritization questions at the junior level they're generally going to be with one patient and at generally most cases they'll usually have one to two comorbidities and you won't commonly see people with multiple three or four or five comorbidities that are standing out that you need to figure out what's going on so that does make it a little bit simpler however as you move on to higher levels there will be adding there'll be added complexity to that in terms of the questions so the examples I have here is that let's say you have the patient that has hypertension then if that patient has a high blood pressure then commonly but not always but in most cases sometimes there's a headache that's associated with hypertension especially if the patient's got a blood pressure of let's say 160 over you know 90 or something like that okay now in this case I would double check to see if there's any other aspects on the alpha prioritization chart that would be prominent to take a look at but if this is a usual thing for the patient and it's an expected finding then it might not be classified as something that's urgent compared to the patient that has hypertension but that has a diminishing level of consciousness okay in this case I'm actually thinking what is the worst case scenario that could be happening here because having hypertension and then having a change in level of consciousness is not something that I would normally expect it's definitely unexpected so I'm going to query do they are they having a stroke are they having you know some type of a ch change with their blood glucose maybe are they becoming septic so I'm asking those kinds of questions so if I'm querying sepsis then I'm looking at airway breathing circulation so it actually brings me up to other priorities on that of course as I had said before I do want to address the underlying condition like that maybe is sepsis but uh, I still need to address the airway breathing circulation first before I can and get them stable in that regard and then address the sepsis afterwards Another more common example that I have for this kind of a case is looking at a patient with COPD. So commonly patients with COPD sat between 88 to 92 percent. So if I actually walked into the room and my patient was sitting at 89, but I knew they had a history of COPD and maybe they didn't have any other uh, findings in my assessment data that indicate there's a red flag here that I need to be concerned about, then I might not con consider that that's a major priority. This patient might be actually be stable. Okay. However, if that COPD, same COPD patient is sitting at 85, I know that that's definitely not normal. So this might actually be a problem. And then with patient with COPD, then there might be some other complications that make uh, managing their breathing more challenging because of that COPD. So that's what we're trying to get at when we're looking at expected versus unexpected findings. 
in some of the NCLEX questions that you're going to get, you're going to get que uh, questions where the client's data uh, sometimes doesn't match what the patient's actually presenting with. So the example that I've used with class before is that uh, you have a patient that's in for a hand surgery. They're pretty much asymptomatic, but you see their potassium level change from a, let's say, a 4.5 to a 7.1. So that's a significant drastic, and let's say this is a change that's over an eight, uh, well, let's say an eight hour shift, okay? Well, even a four hour shift. So a short, I guess I'm saying it's a shorter time frame. So in this case, sometimes you get the question that asks, well, what do you do next as your nursing intervention? And in this case, you'd have to actually take a look and see, does the client's presentation actually match what data is actually being presented? So he saw that drastic change in their potassium level and a potassium level of 7.1, you generally expect that this patient would have some serious issues with their cardiac arrhythmia. It's definitely something going on with their cardiac contractility. However, if this patient doesn't present that, then sometimes the answer will actually be to actually reassess. Okay, So that's actually something to be aware of is if the patient's data doesn't actually match their actual clinical presentation, then should you actually reassess it to determine whether or not your findings are actually accurate? And sometimes that is also another choice that you might see on some of the prioritization questions. So it's just asking you to critically think about whether or not you know, the data matches. And the other, I guess, more practical application of this is that let's sometimes even in the clinical world you've got equipment that malfunctions you've got uh, things that fail so I mean personally I've taken care of patients where I've taken their blood pressure and it came back as 80 over 40 and I've, th I've thought this isn't right my patient is completely you know got proper skin color they're walking talking there's no way they can have 80 over 40 and you take the blood pressure again and you find out that their blood pressure is actually 1 115 over whatever it's actually in the normal range so it's just asking you to double check and make sure you you're seeing what you're what you should be seeing uh, another alternate i guess selection choice that you sometimes have in some of these prioritization questions is the option to actually call the physician or call for help okay so that actually does come up sometimes as a viable option when you look at your interventions and you see that your rest of your interventions don't do anything else to help the patient. Okay, So you, when you look at your interventions, take a look, see if they actually will physiologically help this client and stabilize this client. And if they don't, then that's when you actually need to call the physician and say, essentially, you're advocating for better orders than what you have. So an example of this is you've got a patient that has a blood pressure of, you know, 90 over 60. And let's say one of your options is uh, hold their diuretic. And then the other option is call the physician. Then you can think about that in terms of looking at the quality of the hold the diuretic. The hold the diuretic would affect their circulatory volume, but you're holding a diuretic. You actually haven't actually increased their circulatory volume to address their blood pressure. So in terms of looking at that as an intervention, then that's probably not something that's actually going to help them increase their blood pressure and help increase their perfusion. So in this case, I look at that intervention and say, not good enough. I'm going to actually call a physician and actually probably ask for something, a fluid bolus or something else that would actually get their circulatory system actually stabilized faster. So when you're actually looking at those interventions, then double check to see those interventions and make sure that they are effective before you call the physician. Other things to note, uh, we will always prioritize an unstable patient over a stable patient. So this is why going back to your common red flag indicators and knowing some of the general pathophysiologies of your common illnesses is actually important to know whether or not those results are actually normal. And, but again, we are looking at unstable first, and we will always look at acute care, acute patients first before chronic. Okay, so someone that has uh, ra rapid onset of some illness symptoms, Ill pain, would be something that's more of a priority. So someone like that's in chronic pain, a seven out of ten pain, would probably be, well, sorry, acute pain. I mean, would like seven out of ten would be something that you prioritize over someone that's in chronic pain with a four out of ten pain. Okay. Or even in comparison, someone that has chronic pain would, yeah, so would, would be someone that we would, excuse me, sorry, pardon me, but uh, I mean, yeah, we're generally looking at acute, something that presents acute before chronic, okay. Uh, the other thing that you should be asking yourself is 
what conditions are affecting the patient and what is the worst case scenario that could happen from that condition. So we'll go to the uh, concept of uh, high temperature. So if you look at temperature and it's um, on, on the alpha prioritization, prioritization chart, it's actually listed as exposure to environment. So it's a little bit in the middle to, the, yeah, I guess the fifth, fifth on the prioritization chart. Okay, but their temperature is 39.5 or something like that. Then what is the worst thing that could happen with that patient? Okay, so our worst case scenario, of course, is looking at sepsis. Uh, past sepsis we're looking at shock being perhaps the worst case but we're actually trying to figure out what is the worst case scenario and if I actually address the temperature and maybe the white blood cells or whatever those changes are if the patient is has an infection then will I be able to address or handle the risk for sepsis down the road so essentially what you're trying to figure out is trying to pick the intervention that will do the most benefit to that patient to prevent the worst case scenario. Okay? And also thinking about the worst case scenario will also help you identify what you need to be aware of in terms of guiding your assessment. Okay? So the example would be if you have a patient that's bleeding, then the worst case scenario for that is hypovolemia, which hypovolemia, hypovolemic shock and then potentially death. Okay? Other things to think about with prioritization is, is this a potential problem or an actual problem? Okay, so we will always look at actual problems first because they are the things that are presenting with the relevant data. Okay, so a potential problems example going back to that infection case was that uh, your patient has uh, the, the high temperature. The sepsis would be something that's a potential problem, but your actual problem right now is the temperature. Okay, with that temperature, you just want to assess if there's other uh, prioritization things that take place that might be more important related to the temperature. But generally, so with temperature, it could be fever. Then I might be thinking to look at uh, level of consciousness and Glasgow Coma Scale, things like that. So that might be where I'm looking at. But again, you're looking at the potential, the uh, sorry, the actual problems first before anything that might be potential down the road. Okay. So our next step to this is we're actually going to go through some example questions, and I'm actually going to try to explain. Uh, some of the rationale behind these questions. Okay, so uh, if you want to actually uh, play along, you can actually pause the presentation, try to answer the question yourself, and then unpause the video and then listen to the debrief part of it. So in an NCLEX style exam, these questions are actually known as uh, rank order prioritization questions. So you're actually trying to organize your priorities and your interventions in the order, the most logical order that you can. So in terms of looking at this question, the first thing you'd actually do is you'd actually do your focus ass assessment on pain. Okay? The reason is you have 7 out of 10 pain, and right now I actually don't know what's causing that problem of pain. Okay? Now the argument here is should you take, where, are you taking vital signs or not? Okay? Now uh, you will take vital signs, but actually I have vital signs listed as second on the list here. Okay? So. I'm actually doing the focus assessment of pain because this will actually guide my prioritization and what my interventions will actually be. Okay. So if I find out, as I discussed previously in another example, if that 7 out of 10 pain is from a headache, okay, that changes my prioritization into giving pain medication and monitoring level of consciousness, you know, uh, any therapeutic thing or non-pharmacological things for, for, a, for a migraine or a headache. If that 7 out of 10 pain is for chest pain, then I'm moving toward things, something like oxygen. Okay, Oxygen and then looking at trying to decrease our cardiac output. So that's the reason why I would actually do that focus ass assessment of pain because now this actually tells me what their actual problem is. Taking vital signs is important and it provides me data on how the patient's physiologically responding, but at that point I've taken vital signs and I still haven't necessarily figured out what my interventions are yet. I've just taken vital signs and found out, oh, something's wrong with whatever the vital signs present as, but I still don't really have an idea of what my intervention would be. Okay, so in terms of decision making, I actually need to look at that focus ass assessment of pain to determine, to guide my interventions. Okay. Uh, the other reason that I'm actually doing the focus assessment of pain is remember that if we can have interventions or responses that are as patient-centered as possible, then that's where we want to go. And if you have that patient that's in pain and you actually say to them, well, I understand that you're in a lot of pain right now, I'm going to take your vital signs. 
as opposed to someone that says, you know, I understand that you're in a lot of pain right now. Can you tell me where it hurts? Okay. There's in terms of the looking at that difference of that statement, the assessment of pain actually addresses directly what the patient's concern is because they actually said, I'm in pain, 7 out of 10, and I want a pain injection because it's pretty, it, to that patient, it's pretty severe. Okay. So this is also a more patient centered approach than taking vital signs. So that's the other reason for that. Now, the next steps to this is because in this scenario, the patient can't have any other analgesia in terms of the regularly scheduled analgesia, then you're going to actually advocate to the physician to obtain additional PR and analgesia. Okay? You'll administer the prescribed analgesia, and then the next critical thinking piece to this is that you didn't need to administer the PR and analgesia as, as soon as you could get the order because that would be the main concern of the patient, and they had requested a pain injection. Okay. Uh, and then you'd actually monitor for complications and the reason for this is this is just understanding that you're adding extra analgesia so the risk for complications related to analgesia particularly if they are on opioids is that risk for respiratory depression so they need further monitoring okay then in this case i would actually do the patient education on non pharmacological pain management last okay things to remember if i'm trying to provide patient teaching to someone in seven out of ten pain they're probably not going to be that responsive to my teaching Right. The other thing to think about is non-pharmacological pain management definitely has its place. Okay. It can be very effective in some cases, but for severe pain that's 7 out of 10, it's questionable as to how effective using guided imagery or uh, deep breathing or visu visualization or meditation would actually be with someone in 7 out of 10 pain. And also considering that you're offering education on it, will they actually be receptive to your directions on utilizing pharmacological pain management? So in this case, I'm actually going to hopefully have that analgesia become effective and then offer that as an option in terms of pharmacological non-pharmacological pain management. Okay. So in this example, uh, the patient has abdominal pain and upper GI bleeding. So which nursing action should be the priority? So if you want to take a moment and pause the presentation and answer the question, then we'll actually go and talk further about it. Okay. So the actual answer to this question is actually obtain vital signs. Okay. Now the reason I actually picked uh, obtain vital signs first is we actually know that the patient is in pain, but we actually have an idea that there's a problem with upper GI bleeding. So I actually know what the cause is. Okay. So the argument here for for vital signs is that in terms of alpha prioritization. GI bleeding leads to that circulation and the greatest risk for GI bleeding is that hypovolemia leading to potentially shock and if they actually do have a, an impact of having a decreased, well, I guess a decreased circulatory volume then, and decreased level of perfusion, then this is something that could also affect their oxygenation. Okay, So I actually do want to obtain vital signs because I actually need more data on how severe this problem is. So if it's a GI bleed and it's actually really severe, then my interventions will be changing in terms of uh, giving fluid bolus, uh, applying oxygen, you know, those types of things, as opposed to, let's say, I actually take vital signs and their blood pressure is actually 100 over 60. It might be declining, but again, it might be less urgent as compared to blood pressure of like 80 over 40. So, but that kind of data actually tells me more information about uh, urgency and what interventions I need to do and how rapid I need to act. So it gives me the most information to figure out how, how acute this patient is so that I can intervene as rapidly as possible. Now, if you are thinking about uh, the next steps to this, I know this is not actually a prioritization uh, question, but the other choices here, you've got apply oxygen. Apply oxygen, if I was to prioritize those four interventions, that actually might be your number two priority, but it would depend on what your vital signs would be in this case. So if you had a patient and they have a GI bleed and their blood pressure is 110 over 80 and their O2 sats are, you know, 95% uh, and let's say they're at 22 breaths, uh, breaths per minute, then I might be considering that the rests are okay and I might not need to actually apply oxygen. I actually might, I might in this case actually move on to a symptom analysis of pain. Okay. However, if you actually saw a big variation in their uh, vital signs, so you had rests of 28 and then their sats were like in the 80s, then that might, your oxygen actually might be your second priority in this case. So 
your next two priorities of apply oxygen, apply oxygen or symptom analysis of pain might vary on your uh, obtaining the vital signs but the thing that would actually direct you into what you need to do about those would be figuring out what the vital signs are first okay you have document history of symptoms and that is an option but it's probably going to be your last option because documenting doesn't actually solve my problem of handling their upper GI bleed or even addressing their pain okay so documentation is often going to be one of your later priorities or the end of the priority because now you're you're have already intervened with the patient and actually stabilized them and helped them with their care, then you're actually documenting. So it won't always be the last uh, option when there's prioritization questions, but more commonly it is. But again, if you're looking for documentation, then just make sure that everything else that you need to do for the patient in terms of managing their acuity is actually done first before you document. Now to continue on with this question, let's actually flip some things around. So let's say the patient's in abdominal pain, but I do not know that they're having an upper GI bleed, okay? And I don't have any other data associated with, with that, then this flips actually potentially to symptom analysis of pain as your first choice, because I don't actually know what the, where they're bleeding and I, or what, what the problem is. I don't actually know they have a GI bleed at this point, but I know they have pain, so I need to figure out where the pain is. Okay. So when you're looking at these kinds of questions, all you have to do is shift around some of those uh, pieces of data there, and then you actually it actually alters the actual priorities that you actually pick for the question. So that's just something to be aware of in terms of... Okay, so our next question here, you're performing a pre-op assessment of your patient. Their mental status, level of consciousness, speech orientation are intact. And uh, your patient tells you he's highly anxious about surgery. So what do you do next? So when you're actually reading this data, think about what is the priority concern here, okay? Mental status looks normal, quote unquote normal. Level of consciousness seems to be okay. Speech orientation, everything seems okay. So it looks to me that the presenting problem is anxiety, okay? So when you're looking at that anxiety, what, what alterations in health and what on the alpha or the alpha prioritization chart might this impact so commonly with people with anxiety we're probably going to see some changes in their vital signs okay so maybe increase in pulse rate maybe increase in blood pressure maybe a change in their respirations okay so you're thinking about that in terms of your overall context so when you actually look at the actual four choices that you have here this actually will probably lead you to trying to gather more data remember in most cases We'll assess first if we need more data. Okay, so uh, because there are other mental status L LOC speech orientation were intact, I do have actual assessment data already here. Okay, however, I'm actually probably missing the most relevant data that relates to anxiety. So in this case, oxygen levels. If there's other choices here that I'd be interested in looking at as potential choices, I'd be looking at something related to vital signs in terms of pulse or blood pressure. If those were options, I would potentially take a look at those as top choices too, along with oxygen. Okay. So I'm trying to see what their physiological impact is because everything else tells me they're normal. So I do want to know if there's any abnormalities with that. And picking the assessed oxygen levels actually tells me if anything's abnormal, okay? The other thing is that with the other interventions here, you've got give anti-anxiety medications, okay? Essentially, that is a potential, potential choice and it's something that would be correct for this patient, but you need to actually evaluate what your patient's health status is before you give them medications, okay? Whether they're scheduled medications or PRN medications, generally there should be some nursing assessment of, when, of whether or not you should actually give that medication. You'll see that very commonly when you've been giving blood pressure medications, you assess apical rate and pulse as your standard assessment. So in this case, I might actually want to assess their oxygenation levels because I want to figure out you know, what's their level of oxygenation before I give anti-anxiety medications? When you're looking at that option of anti-anxiety medications, also consider what is the pharmacology behind anti-anxiety medications? In this case, a lot of our anti-anxiolytics, anti-anxiety medications actually cause sedation, sleep, drowsiness, okay? So this is something that would affect their gas exchange and the respirations. So I do want to have that data on their current oxygen level so that way I can evaluate the effectiveness of the anti-anxiety medication so that's the other reason why I'd assess oxygen levels first and then potentially look at anti-anxiety medications as potentially a second option once I've done my assessment. Notify physician, 
Okay, so this is another potential choice, and as as I said, notify physician most of the time isn't the most uh, most the number one choice unless your other interventions aren't actually effective for this patient. I would say that assessing oxygen levels is probably going to be more effective to determine my patient's health status. And if the patient's anxious, and let's say their oxygen levels are fine, then probably giving anti-anxiety medications as prescribed would probably be another better choice than notifying the, ph the physician because right now I've got all the in interventions I need to help manage their anxiety. Okay, When you're actually looking at this as well, uh, you've got mental status, LOC, speech, orientation, all normal. Okay, So think about what are you actually advocating, why are you notifying notifying this physician, what do you want to obtain, or what's your your role in terms of contacting this physician? What do you expect? Okay, Things to also consider is you, uh, the patient's also highly anxious about his surgery. Is this a normal finding? Unexpected or unexpected finding? Okay, So most cases, a patient most people would probably be pretty nervous when they're having surgery. Okay, now highly anxious, you'd have to do more assessment to find out how how I, high what does highly anxious mean to someone. Okay, so there's some variability in there, but we're not going to worry too much about that. But so you tell the physician that LOC speech orientation intact or normal, and the patient's anxious. Your physician's probably going to tell you, oh, okay, so those seem like pretty normal findings to me. So what is your concern? You haven't actually given the the physician any data to help you with problem solving or care for this patient. You've told them that pretty much everything is relatively normal except that they might be a little, that they might be pretty anxious. And the physician will say, well, they're having surgery, so what is the physiological impact of their anxiety? Is there something I need to be concerned about? So again, that leads you back to the uh, assessing of oxygen levels. In this case, the other thing I'll point out is uh, context might be something that is important in this case. So your patient's going for surgery. so thinking about going for surgery and that fact that they might be under some type of anesthesia, they might have uh, pain medications on board with surgery, those might be also things that affect their oxygenation level and their breathing. So this again leads me back toward oxygen, oxygen levels Okay, in terms of the context. Uh, the last option there was making social services consults, so consulting a social worker or consulting someone about uh, uh, relationship, psychosocial status, those types of things, financial supports, things like that. That's something that probably is something that would be uh, more of a, if you're thinking about potential problems or actual problems, the, the actual problem here is the anxiety. Making a social services consult is probably something that addresses something that's more of a potential problem. Okay, So that's maybe not the first choice. The other thing to think about is um, in terms of uh, chronic or acute. right? Highly, high anxious with surgery, there's a good chance that after that surgery is done, if the surgery hopefully went well for this patient, their anxiety will probably decline over time. So you're looking at an acute problem rather than a chronic problem. Now if this patient had multiple psychosocial concerns about support and things like that that are chronic, then I mean if the oxygen and the other options like ABC weren't there, then maybe social services consult might be a more major problem if there's nothing else that was more acute as a presentation, but generally we're looking for acute first. So that's the other explanation for this. Now, the other thing I'm going to do for you now is I'm actually going to talk about changing the context for you a little bit here. So let's remove this patient and say that they're not actually having surgery. We're going to put them on a mental health nursing unit, okay? And the thing is that we're going to say that this patient's highly anxious and they're very upset and they're pacing around the unit, they're angry, angry because they just had a fight with their significant other. Okay. And they're saying, you know, I don't want to be here, get the hell away from me. I just want something for my anxiety. Okay. So I've changed the context and I realize that some of you don't have a lot of experience yet in mental health. Okay. So I understand that, but I'm just trying to give you another perspective on looking at this. So your patient is angry, they're upset, they're not happy, they want something for anxiety. In this case, I might actually go to answer B if that context changes and give them the anti-anxiety medications. Now, I'm thinking about in this case, I've got orders for anti-anxiety medications. The patient wants something for anxiety. Am I able to assess their oxygen levels while they're this angry? They're upset. They're telling me, get away from me. I don't want to talk to you. I'm upset. I'm angry. I want something for my anxiety. And they're angry. So in this case, you're also keeping into the idea of patient safety. Okay. Assessing their oxygen levels is useful, it's helpful, it actually does give us 
information about you know how effective is that anti-anxiety medication but also consider with an anti-anxiety medication I'm also looking for other other clinical data that will tell me that that anti-anxiety medication is working so I'm going to look hopefully if I'm assessing this patient I give them the anti-anxiety medication I can still determine whether their uh, the medication is working by seeing a decline in some of their behaviors them calm down then they relax they become less angry they settle down okay so the other thing in this case is that so the context change and majority of the time there's a fair amount of patients in mental health settings that are relatively stable in terms of their overall vital signs okay and I know you don't might not know this but just something to think about in terms of um, the overall presenting problem so I've changed the context on you to a patient that's angry and upset for different reasons and my priority might right now might be give anti-anxiety medications okay then you know I might notify the physician if I didn't have any other interventions. The other thing is actually so making a social services consult might be something that actually becomes a lot more relevant. So if I change that context and I change that from uh, having a patient that is angry and upset with their uh, significant other to I lost my home and I have no, I lost my job, I have no way to support myself and I'm anxious for that, then my priorities might actually be give the anti-anxiety medications and make a social services consult because those address my patient's concerns right away. Okay. So that's just the idea of fl flipping that context around for you and seeing how those priorities change for you. Okay, so another question here, when intervention will be most effective is sort of what we're looking at in terms of the context of this. Okay. So in this case, we're assessing the 22-year-old and things to keep an eye on here. Uh, emergency surgery, multiple transfusions, anxious labored respirations, 34 breaths per minute. You have a lot of clinical data there, so O2 sats at 90%, and 6 liters via nasal cannula. Okay. Things to keep in mind here, what is your overall scope of practice and understanding of oxygen delivery that comes into play here. So keeping in mind that your oxygen delivery device by nasal cannula, generally six liters is sort of the max. Five to six liters is sort of the max maximum amount that we want nasal cannula via oxygen, or oxygen via nasal cannula, sorry. Okay, so their SATs at 90%, which is pretty low, considering that they're on, well, low, yeah, pretty low for someone that's on six liters, okay? The 34 breaths per minute. That is a clinical red flag indicator because you can consider how long are they gonna be stable on a respiration rate of 34 breaths per minute. Okay, and especially that they're labored. Eventually the body is going to give out. They won't be able to maintain that respiration rate for a very long time. Okay. Also, another thing to take a look at, they're 22 years old. Okay. We commonly don't see 22 year old people that maybe have this serious of a impact of this kind of respiration rate. Okay. The good thing is that they're young, so hopefully they can maintain that for a little bit of a time. But again, they just had emergency surgery. So that's a concern, okay, especially because they are this young and their respiration rate is this altered, okay. So if you take a look at these answers, you have to actually take a look and see which of these interventions will actually be effective for helping this patient, okay. So example, the answer to this is actually switching the patient to a non-rebreather mask to 95 to 100% oxygen and probably calling the physician, okay. So, uh, O2 by nasal cannula at six liters, you need to put them on something higher, okay, to get that O2 sat up. So definitely uh, that's probably the best top choice intervention that will actually help this patient's respiratory status. If you look at uh, answer B there, uh, incentive spirometry and splinting while they cough is something that we probably would have for helping them with their respirations after they've been stabilized, okay. And, and again, we do things like incentive spirometry, so think about the context of the intervention for things like uh, preventing infection, uh, promoting lung expansion after surgery, when you know um, preventing uh, atelectasis of the lungs. So we use those types of things more often as health promotion type activities rather than emergency activities. Okay. Uh, administering morphine sulfate to decrease anxiety and re reduce hyperventilation. So those will have that effect on the patient. Okay, morphine. However, the patient doesn't have a report of pain right now. So that's an issue right now. The other thing to consider is that six, O2 at 6 liters per minute at 90%, there's a good chance that 
that they're going to continue to decline in terms of their respiratory status if we don't do anything, especially at 34 breaths per minute. So if I give them something that's an opioid analgesic that causes respiratory depression, then there's a potential that they will continue to decline in terms of their O2 status. They might see if they drop into the mid to low 80s, they might see some changes in level of consciousness. Plus, I've also contributed to respiratory depression potentially by giving them morphine okay, in terms of an opioid. So that's probably not your best choice intervention there because it actually would be a bit detrimental to the patient. Even though there are some, technically there are some benefits of reducing anxiety and reducing their rest rate, but that's probably not how we want to do it. Okay. Uh, and then we've got D there, increasing the flow rate on the oxygen to 10 liters. Okay. And remember, in terms of scope of practice and safe uh, administration of oxygen that generally by nasal cannula it's not the best method. You technically in real practice could do that temporarily while you were getting your rebreather set up but it probably wouldn't be quite as effective. Okay so things to think about with this 10 liters per minute is not a safe rate for a uh, nasal cannula and the other part to this is that it says uh, reassess the patient in 10 minutes. Okay. Remember that they're in a declining respiratory state. You probably want to put them on continuous oxygen and monitoring and continuous oxygen sat monitoring, probably monitoring their vital signs, probably Q5 minutes. You know, So when you're actually answering these kinds of questions, take a look at them. Can you think of the intervention, even before you, interventions that you want to do, even before you look at the answers? Okay, Sometimes that will kind of cue you into, hey, you know what? I think I know what I'd want to do for this patient. Is my intervention that I think? actually on this list of things that would make sense for me. Okay. So that might be something that also helps promote your critical thinking behind some of these questions. So in this uh, question, this is an assessment of patient acuity. These are commonly questions that you'd see in your senior acute care type courses because now you're actually adding on multiple patients and the prioritization of multiple patients. So. The thing to remember is start working on prioritization within a single patient first because once you can do that and once you feel comfortable with that, that will give you the ability to start prioritizing between two patients or multiple patients. Now the other challenge to these kinds of questions that you're going to see in senior acute care is that you'll have four different patients or you know, four or five patients listed there and now they might all have different comorbidities so it requires you to actually understand a lot more of your pathophysiology, pharmacology, expected and unexpected findings to actually try to make your decision about which patient you'd want to see first. Okay. So take a moment, you can pause this and then we'll actually talk about which patient you would see first. The answer to this question, the patient I'd actually see first is actually patient D. Okay. 50 years old with asthma who complains of shortness of breath after using a bronchodilator. So my main considerations with this is that I've given them a bronchodilator and they're still short of breath, which means my nursing intervention was not effective. Okay. Other things to keep in mind, that patient's 50 years old. 50 years old is pretty young. Okay. So generally, a usual 50 year old, I mean, I know they do have asthma, but they usually probably in terms of looking at uh, physiological changes and ability to maintain homeostasis, Generally, the younger you are in terms of being a younger adult, the better you are in terms of your physiological capability to maintain your health. Okay, so 50 years old, short of breath, using a bronchodilator after using a bronchodilator is probably something that you need to see right away because they need further intervention. Okay, so that is the answer. The other thing we'll do right now is we'll also try to actually prioritize your remaining patients. Okay, so the next patient that you'd see next is actually probably patient C. Okay, 70 years old with pneumonia needs to be started on intravenous antibiotics. Okay, with this, he has pneumonia, which means he already has a uh, an actual problem of infection. Okay, he needs antibiotics, which means he hasn't maybe had a lot of actual intervention or treatment for that yet. So that again is something that we need to address quite quickly. He's 70 years old, which means that 70 years old, probably more variable or more labile in terms of their ability to maintain their health because again the older you are the less likely you are to actually maintain your homeostasis and your overall well-being and your health okay you have more comorbidities in this case more often as you age and of course also along with those physiological physiological changes of aging so i'm actually going to see this patient with pneumonia because he has an an actual problem that i need to address okay however it does uh 
is second compared in terms of alpha prioritization to uh, airway breathing circulation. Okay. The next patient that I'm actually going to see would, would actually vary. Now, there's actually two choices here of A or B, and I'll give you a little bit of the context in terms of making this decision. Okay, so in this case, I might actually see patient A. Okay, now patient A is on a ventilator, which means they've had some issues with their um, their health status. Okay, people on ventilators are commonly quite acute. However, in this case, there was no actual data that actually indicated that they actually had a pre presenting acute problem that I needed to address right away. Their issue right now is they need a sputum specimen sent to the lab. Okay, so the only other decisions that data that I'm pulling from this that makes it a higher or lower priority is, is that specimen a stat specimen that we need right away? Okay, so I know there's no data in here that indicates that, but let's say it says we need a stat specimen for uh, wound cultures or, uh, or, sorry, not wound culture, but uh, sputum culture for whatever anti antibiotics and things like that. Then if it's a stat specimen, I might say, oh, that's for sure my third patient that I need to see because they're on a ventilator, plus they need a specimen right away. It needs to be done. Okay. However, if this is a specimen that can wait, that's something that you know can be done anytime during the day, then this drops in terms of my priorities, as long as that patient's sta stable, because they do have a respiratory issue in terms of being on a ventilator, but they're currently nothing presenting that needs to be, that's acute. Okay. A uh, 55-year-old with uh, COPD as a patient B, he is probably going to be your last patient, uh, the only, uh, because he's satting at 90%, which was an expected finding for someone with COPD. My only consideration with this is he ha his last pulse oximetry reading was from the previous shift. So I'm going to question here whether or not I need to take a new set of vitals. This is the a reason why he might be n number three patient over patient A. Okay. So if there's concerns about that in terms of, ooh, I need to, um, to actually check his uh, vital signs again because his last reading was, was uh, last shift. It would depend on when his last shift was. If it was like shift change and you just come on, then it's not an issue. But I know there's not that data in this scenario, but those would be the considerations I'd be thinking about in terms of seeing these kinds of questions and things that I'd be looking for. Okay, Do I need a new set of vials? However, everything else about him actually indicates that he is actually uh, no, no presenting concerns. Uh, well, two sets fine, though he does have an airway issue, but nothing presenting as acute. So he's probably my fourth choice in this case. Okay, so in this question, I'm actually looking at my nursing assessment and also the concepts of patient safety. So nurse Florence, Florence Nightingale, enters the room and finds a client lying on the floor. What actions should the nurse perform first? Okay, so you can feel free to take a moment and pause and then I'll get back to some answering some of these questions. So the answer to this is actually, I'm going to actually assess the client for injury first, okay? Uh, things that I'm thinking about, I actually don't know if the patient has any problems I need to be aware of. So I actually do need to assess for help to actually determine are there injuries that will actually guide my nursing care in this case, okay? Things to think about, uh, was this a, a, fall, a fall or was this a fall? Uh, was this an unwitnessed fall or a witness fall? Because that sometimes plays into um, your assessment of this client. Uh, did they injure themselves in terms of hitting their head? Because that changes things in if they actually hit their head. If they hit their head, then it's, again, in th terms of thinking about the alpha prioritization chart, this leads me into looking at things like uh, neuro assessment, GCS, things like that. Do they have a change in level of consciousness? So it leads me into other things that might be take precedence. Okay, so trying to figure out that. Uh, take vital signs is important, okay, however, you also want to think about the patients lying on the floor. How capable are you to take vital signs on that? I still need to assess the client for injury because let's say they broke their arm. I probably don't want to take vital signs on the arm that's broken. Okay, I probably don't need want to position the client into a position where I can move them unless I know that they are not injured, which actually kind of eliminates um, moving the client or helping the client get back to bed. Essentially with a, a patient lying on the floor, you probably shouldn't move them until you know that they're safe and that they're not injured, okay? Because moving them and so moving them back to bed or assisting them to a sitting position might be things that actually exacerbate any injury that they've already had, especially if they've broken something, okay? So in most cases, I want to assess for injury, see if there's any presenting problems that will guide my nursing care. 
then if the patient's okay, it's probably easiest for me to take vital signs once they're actually in bed. So I might actually assist the client to a sitting position, right? And the other thing to think about with assisting the client to sitting position, if they're conscious and they're and if they're conscious, it's probably not very comfortable to be lying on a hospital floor, which might be dirty with people walking around and things like that. So I'd want to try the system to sitting up. It also helps maintain their dignity of not lying on the floor with people standing around them because that's also potentially embarrassing for the patient. So I probably want to assist them into a sitting position, let them regain their breath, let them regain their senses, and then I probably want to call for help to get them back to bed. And then I might actually take vital signs last. So when you're thinking about this, I had said like some, some of our prioritization was take vital signs first. In this case, I'm actually taking it last, okay? But of course, this will change if, if I, depending on whether the client's actually injured or not, okay? So let's say they fell and they actually broke a rib and they punctured their lung and had a pneumothorax, attention pneumothorax, which is a respiratory issue. This might be a case where I actually might want to take vital signs first, especially if I notice problems with the respiration. So I'm just throwing that in there in terms of alterations with this kind of a scenario that will alter your prioritization. Okay. But generally, if I find that the client's not injured, then I, after my assessment, then I would put them into sitting position and then call for help, get them back to bed, then take vital signs. Okay. And of course, this wasn't an actual um, organization prioritization order type question, but I'm just giving you examples of, of what I'm thinking about when I'm looking at this. So this brings us to our last practice question here. Okay. And this is just about that prioritization piece, looking at the uh, alpha prioritization chart. So we've got some issues with dyspnea, chest pain, syncope, okay, so changes in level of consciousness. And then we also note pale, diaphoretic, and blood pressure is on the low side. The respiration is 33. Client's anxious, fearing death. Okay. So the answer to this question is actually administer oxygen via nasal cannula. Now, I know there are some concerns with this because nasal cannula and the respiration rate at that rate is maybe not going to help for very long. Okay, But out of these options, it's probably your, your best choice right away. Okay, So in this case, I'd probably be putting them on oxygen via nasal cannula, probably at six liters. Okay, just want to make sure that their respirations are handled in this case because they do have dyspnea. Okay, and the rate's 33, which means that overall it's not a sustainable respiration rate for very long. Okay. Uh, again, we're looking at airway breathing being their priorities. Okay, when I look at this scenario, the other cues here would be looking at that chest pain. Okay, so chest pain and thinking about what is the most important thing to do with the actual chest pain. And things that I'd actually be looking at. My, my concern with the chest pain is that I'm actually wondering if the patient is potentially having some type of a myocardial infarction or something like that. Also, the other thing is that they're anxious, fearing death. Okay, Feelings, fearing, fearing death is something that sometimes is more common with uh, with chest pain or heart attack, am I? So remember the other part to this is I do want to try to decrease their cardiac workload, okay? Especially in terms of trying to preserve their, uh, their uh, reduce that risk for infarction and tissue damage, okay? So I might actually be administering pain medications as my second choice priority here because by doing that, uh, some type of uh, morphine or opioid, I can actually decrease that chest pain, help reduce their anxiety, and then also reduce their cardiac workload. So. I'm suspecting potentially worst case scenario might be myocardial infarction. Okay. Uh, my next part here is probably administering IV fluids. Okay. Their blood pressure is low. Okay. So that is something that's definitely a concern in terms of their perfusion. But again, I'm looking at uh, chest pain in terms of my most worst case scenario is that they actually have an MI and potentially die. So that's the reason why I know uh, pain generally is rated as lower than circulation in terms of what I'm, what I'm looking at, but the risk factors for having chest pain is actually that they risk death, okay? So that's the worst possible case scenario here, okay? But again, thinking about your interventions uh, about for this client with uh, myocardial infarction, usually we'll start with oxygen, we'll give some type of a pain management medication, then we'll look at something for anticoagulation, okay? And then again, the other things that we'll do is we'll try to 
you know, administer IV fluids to get, maintain a, a proper blood pressure. So that's sort of what we're looking at in this case. Administer dopamine as your option C there might not be the best choice. Okay, potentially if they are actually having chest pain and a potential uh, myocardial infarction, dopamine will make their is an inotrope which will make their heart contract harder and faster. So that's probably not something that's actually going to help with their chest pain. It might actually exacerbate their chest pain. So that's probably why that's not the actual best situation. However, we can actually flip that. Uh, flip this uh, scenario around a little bit. If we actually take out that chest pain, okay, they're not in chest pain, maybe we'll even take off that they don't have anxi uh, anxiety and they're not fearing death, then dopamine might be a higher priority intervention because now I'm actually looking at maintaining perfusion and I'm not actually concerned about having an MI, that I actually do want to give them something to make their blood pressure go and you know have their heart rate pump faster. So I might in this case, if I remove the chest pain, uh, let's say they still have the oxygen thing. I'd still, still probably go with oxygen, but let's say I move the chest pain, then I might actually move toward administering IV fluids and then administering an inotrope to actually help with their uh, perfusion. So that might be the thing where I've actually dropped pain completely off the list of priorities. So that'd be the other concern. Okay, so that's the end of this presentation. Some general suggestions. Uh, get into practicing the NCLEX style questions, look for the alternate format questions and actually try your hand at them. So the alternate format questions are the ones where you actually have a list of five to six nursing interventions and you actually have to prioritize them in order. You don't see them quite as common as, uh, as your regular multiple choice style questions, but you do still see them sometimes. You also sometimes see select all that apply questions. So sometimes you might have ones where you actually have a list of five interventions, select all that apply, select all the ones that are correct and all the ones, and then do not select the interventions that are incorrect. So you might see some of those as select all that apply type questions related to prior, well, related to selecting the best interventions. Uh, other things to think about in terms of leveling of uh, questions. When you get to your senior acute care, at some point they're also going to start asking you more about delegation. With, uh, along with your priority setting. So there'll be the addition of extra multiple patients to prioritize between. And then the leadership piece to this in terms of your fourth year senior le level type questions would be which patient do you assign to the healthcare aid? Which patient do you assign to the LPN? And those are, are, are higher level questions because they actually involve you understanding the scope of practice of other healthcare professionals and assigning them correctly based on the acuity of the patient. So those are some of the higher level uh, priority setting type of questions that you're going to get as you move into your senior acute care courses. So those will be the other things to think about in terms of the questions. In most of the NCLEX type exams, you'll actually have a variety of questions as you get to the senior level. So it won't be all of the top level, highest level, hardest questions. You'll get a variety of them. Uh, other suggestions and tips for you. Make a list of the questions that you want to ask yourself or to jog your memory or to jog your thinking when you're approaching these kinds of anaclex questions. So uh, going back to the first few slides there, I've asked a couple questions. Are they chronic? Are they stable? You know, is it a presenting problem? Is it a um, uh, potential problem? So you can actually make a list of questions or make a checklist for yourself that might help guide your thinking behind this. Is there enough assessment data? Is there not? Are the interventions appropriate? So those types of things. So that might help you to work through some of these questions. Um, Try to understand the rationale behind these types of questions. So you, as you practice these, you will get them wrong. Okay, I know as a student, I got them wrong as well. Okay, so as you get more experience, the more you do, the more you'll understand that rationale for that. The other thing is you can do these with a friend, do these in a group, ask other people to explain the rationale for you. Find your instructors, find people that are senior nursing students, find people that are experienced, and they might be able to cue you in on other things that guide the rationale behind the answers to those questions. And then keep building that prioritization. Remember, you can prioritize with one patient. You can definitely move on to two, but you still need to be able to work with one first before you can move on. Okay. So thank you for listening to this presentation and the best of luck with your prioritization.